Hi everyone, welcome to Current Kick. My name is Billy, and thanks for stopping by for my review and thoughts on Exandria Unlimited. Current Kick is the home of my hobbies and interests. I'm a big fan of Critical Role, first experiencing D&D and Critical Role via Critical Role across Kinda Funny about five years ago. Fun fact, the first time we see a version of Jester. We've heard so many things about you. With this episode, my curiosity was piqued for Dungeons and Dragons. Always been a fan of fantasy and role-playing games. JRPGs, Western RPGs such as Dragon Age Origins is a favorite of mine. Novels such as The Lord of the Rings or Forgotten Realms, featuring none other than Drista Erden, I've been reading since a teenager. Seeing how much fun this crossover episode was, I started consuming some one-shots here and there. D and Diesel, Celebrity D and D with Terry Crews, Stephen Colbert's D and D Adventure. Those were a few that I checked out first and enjoyed. Nothing much else came of it for a few years. I attempted Campaign 1 once and couldn't commit to the amount of hours and episodes that there were, only watching a few episodes before dropping off. But then, something happened about a year ago. I stumbled upon the Call of Cthulhu Shadow of the Crystal Palace one-shot by Taliesin Jaffe. The story that Taliesin told, the role-playing by the cast, it was just all so fantastic, I had to see more. I proceeded to start Campaign 2 after watching this one-shot, and I've been hooked on it ever since. At the time of this recording, I'm on episode 65 of Campaign 2. So, enough about me, you're here for Alexandria Limited. Is Alexandria Limited good? Is it a good starting point for a newcomer to tabletop role-playing games? What about a good short series to complete while waiting for Campaign 3 to start? The answer to all those questions, and my personal opinion, is no. No, no, and no. Alexandria Unlimited is bad. While there are some bright spots here and there, overall it is a complete mess with some episodes borderline unwatchable. We're going to dive deep into the why, so buckle up and remember this is a review, a critique. None of this is a personal attack on Critical Role or anyone involved. I'm a fan, a critter myself, and I simply enjoy reviewing the content I consume. The party meets at Everdon, a party for Civilization's Dawn and promises to hold through for the new year. But we, the viewer, the listener, the consumer, of Exandria Unlimited, do not see this celebration. We instead are introduced to the characters one by one the following morning. New DM, or how she likes to be called, GM, Abria Eingar, asks each PC where they wake up and how they feel from the previous night of partying. Orum, a human fighter of the Arashari, played by Liam O'Brien. Fern Calloway, a satyr druid, played by Ashley Johnson. Dorian Storm, an Air Genasi bard, played by Robbie Damon. Derek Zevian, a dwarf sorcerer, played by Matthew Mercer. Opal, a human hexblade warlock, played by Amy Carrero. Fyra Rai, a fire genasi monk, played by Angelai Bimani. What is Exandria Limited about? As mentioned earlier, our adventure starts off with the party waking up from a heavy night of drinking. Although they all mysteriously don't remember the following night, and more significantly, the previous week, after our introductions and a little too much potty humor, our group heads home from breakfast where they run into Pasca, a thief of the Nameless Ones, a group of thieves' guild criminals who are rampant in the city of Iman. This Pasca is seen marking the house they are staying at, Pasca easily spills the beans on her true intentions and gives the party a test job for some thievery. Prove their worth and there's some coin and the potential for more jobs from the Thieves Guild. Everyone is game, except Orem, who isn't really cool with being a criminal. What transpires from here is quite a lot. The plot is grand and has many hooks, but remember this is just an 8 episode mini campaign and boy does it feel like it. After viewing the campaign essentially three times throughout my weekly reviews of each episode on my blog, and in preparation for this review, I can sum up Exandria Limited as this. Have you ever played an open world RPG that gives you free reign to do whatever you desire rather quickly? You know the kind, your character's just thrown into it and told, have at it. Think The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, or Kingdoms of Amalur Re-Reckoning, a game I've played some of this year. After a brief opening, and within the first couple of hours of either game, you, the player, can essentially lose yourself in side quest after side quest, completely abandoning the main plot for hours. The abundance of options allow you to switch to a quest that's not nearly as important or grand as the main quest itself. If it feels boring, or if you simply stumble upon a new NPC on the road, you ban that current quest line, putting it on the back burner. You know, maybe for later, and grab a few other side quests. The next area you get to, you continue this cycle over and over again until you've forgotten half of the quest you're supposed to complete, and so on and so forth. This is exactly how I feel Exandria Unlimited plays out. The campaign starts out simple enough to follow. Shouldn't we be worried about the big bad guild that should be chasing our party? Yet, we run into Opal's hometown, have a talent show. Granted, it's a fun time and a great listen, but just kind of feels odd and disjointed. Many times throughout the series, the party would be on questline A, only to drop that for B, 
A side quest now brings them to quest line C. It's hard to follow. A running theme throughout many of my episode reviews is confusion. Confusion because the plot or er, plots. Alexandria Limit just has so much going on. Some of the blame will go to the characters and their decisions. This is a pretty fucking chaotic group of assholes, but we will get to them a little later. We need to first discuss our DM, GM, Abria Iyengar and her magical hat of unlimited story hooks. Let's look at what exactly is going on in the EXU. The party loses a week of memories. Pasca and the Thieves Guild. The Crown. The Ashhole. The Ashari. Gilmore. Interacting with gods. Fyra Rai. Lost City of Nirdal Pak. Dark Mirror Fern. Mirada Nizalor. Ted. I think this is all of the main plot hooks. Remember this series is 8 episodes long? I just gave 12 plot hooks. I'm not even mentioning some of our hours long random pageant show or shopping sequences. Some of these plot hooks are not resolved. Memory loss, Pasca, why gods were so interested in a group of low level nobodies. Now, I'm okay with not having everything resolved, but it just seems odd that some of these aren't. Take the Pasca Nameless Ones hook for example. A fantastic sequence where Fern casts Charm Person on Pasca to avoid the insinuating battle. By the time the charm is up, which is only an hour later, Pasca seems to just give up and not follow them? I just don't understand how this large, seemingly powerful thieves guild just leaves a group that stole their prize alone because they left the city. This, in my opinion, should have been more integral to the story. This is a good hook. A nice low-level story about a thieves guild chasing after a group that crossed them, but that's really it for Pasca and the Nameless Ones. From here, the plot, I found, becomes extremely hard to keep up with what is going on. It's all an odd mix of throwing plot hooks at a dartboard to see what sticks, side quests, and railroading. Now, I fully understand that EXU was only an 8 episode mini campaign. It needed to grab us and tell a fully cohesive story, so I get and expect some railroading. But the way Abria handled the railroading was odd. I almost wish she did more of it so we had a story that followed the hero's journey. Departure. The call to adventure. The party takes on this quest and winds up stealing the circlet and leaving him on. Initiation. The Road of Trials, The Crown, Mirror Fern, Lost Interest in the Group, Return. This could have been the defeat of Pasca, the Nameless Ones, maybe even the refusal of the Spider Queen. I think this journey is a much simpler but personal story that would have done wonders for Exandria Unlimited. Granted, this is not a scripted story we are consuming. This is Dungeons and Dragons. There are going to be wild cards. WILD CARD BITCHES! Yeah! But the way some of the plot hooks, side events, and even some of the battles are handled are just forced because Abria created them and wanted to show them off. A big problem, none of these four sequences are great or memorable, and our party isn't given a choice before they just happen. Let's look right at the very first battle of the campaign. The party is looking to escape, but Abria tells them that they run into the warehouse where Liam remarks about having being chased and forced into a warehouse where the combat takes place. We've got to go inside, it's the only safe place. And Abria literally says, You let me do this! <laughs> <laughs> I worked so hard on this map, you have to go in there! Yeah. This is a major theme that comes up throughout Exandria Unlimited. GM tells the PCs what they are doing, what they are thinking, how they feel. Many times throughout the campaign, a player rolls poorly and Nabria gives it to them anyway. I'll make you roll for it. Yes. Uh, give me a history check. Oh, perfect. Yeah! <laughs> First roll of the night. Uh, that's a zero. You go back and think about everything you know about the city. And you know, like you know, that going through the Eastern Gate has got to be the safest way because you don't go through the slums. And the slums is usually where like thieves would hang out, so. Why even make the player roll if you were gonna give them the information anyway? All that does is ruin the immersion of the story and the fact that this is a game. It's not really a game of Dungeons and Dragons if dice rolls and rules don't matter, right? I wanted to see if the dice would allow me to tell a good story. Please. And this natural one. <laughs> Why ask for the dice rolls at this point? Just tell the story you want. It has to be one or the other. Prepare for chaos and roll with it, or railroad and tell a story worth sharing. Let's look at the chase sequence from episode 6, The Gift Among the Green. Right from the beginning, Opal is hit with a dart as the party walks into the street. Bree's intention here has got to be have Opal pass out and be taken hostage, all while the party chases along. A great sequence. But the GM gives Amy the ability to roll for the effects of the dart, which what do you know, Amy passes. Opal's only sort of abductive and we go through this weird invisible meat beast, whatever the hell those are, odd chase sequence. This all could have been fixed with simply telling Opal, 
a dart hits you and you pass out. It's this odd game that gets played through Alexandria Unlimited with dice. They can be asked for extremely simple actions, such as looking for food in a kitchen, to almost random wisdom saving throws. When they should be there, they aren't. And when they are there, they shouldn't. Half the time the dice rolls don't matter anyway, almost as if they're all wearing plot armor. I feel like there was a lot of pressure in both Critical Role and Abria to make Alexandria Unlimited great and epic. The perfect series for newcomers, and to give confidence to the current fanbase that someone other than Matt can successfully run a Critical Role campaign. Because, let's be honest, Critical Role has a lot going on. From the Vox Machina animated series, to opening their own publishing company for board games and D&D books, to merchandise and miniature sets, and more. Unfortunately, they hyped up Abria as the next best game master since sliced bread, and she did not, in my opinion, even come close to being good, let alone amazing in Alexandria Unlimited. Abria is not mad, that is very clear. Alexandria Unlimited suffers because of this. As a whole, EXU is a complete mess. It's bland, boring, and lacks direction. It just has way too much going on. Since this literally is Critical Role, I think this comparison is fair game. Matt Mercer is a fantastic DM and is one of the reasons why I and assume many of you are fans of Critical Role. The Mercer effect is the unrealistic expectations on new D&D players who believe their games will be just like Critical Roles. A dungeon master who fantastically weaves together plots and subplots and does voices, or create memorable NPCs, sometimes at the drop of a dime. For a home game, is this expectation unrealistic? Yes, definitely. From another DM running a hyped game from Critical Role itself? No. We have expectations that the content we will be consuming will be of the highest quality. Is Matt or Campaign 2 perfect? Hell no. There are times Matt gets rules wrong, or sequences that are boring because they go on for a little too long, for sure. But in my experience, Campaign 2, it feels like an open world, where the PCs have choice, where the decisions have weight and impact. Exandria Unlimited does not give this feeling of choice and wonder. Abria almost never asked the party what they would like to do next. I've used the phrase railroading a few times already. It's because Exandria Unlimited isn't an open world. It's on rails. For the most part, the party jumps from one curated sequence to the other. How many times during this campaign do we run into this situation? A scene opens with our GM asking for some type of saving throw, and regardless of the role, railroads our party to their next destination. Take episode 4, By the Road, for example. Fern rolls a 12. 12? <laughs> After about two weeks on the road, Fern has a strong urge slash sense from miles away, deep in the woods. She feels a calling. Fern is told by the GM that she winds up leading the party off the road deeper and deeper into the woods. You have a strong urge, or a sense. Now, I'm okay with most of this, because this leads to one of my favorite sequences of the entire campaign, the dark mirror fern. But I digress. Why is the GM telling a character what they feel and what they do? Almost as quickly as we learn about this plot where Fern puts on the crown, kills everyone, and becomes all-powerful in a different dimension that the party could actually decide to go through, the portal disappears because the seemingly all-powerful evil Fern is defeated by this low-level group. This could have been an amazing, big bad storyline. But what happens next? A pageant show. EXU just feels like a bunch of different set pieces strung together. For me, this plays out like this. Take this same episode. By the Road, Episode 4, Abria had two set pieces to go through in this episode because that's what she planned for. A deep forest battle to use her terrain and introduce Fiverrai and Mirada Nizalor, and then the pageant show in By Rodin. After the post-battle sequence is wrapped up, Fyra takes the reins of the cart, Bria mentions that Fyra is so badass she doesn't need to roll an animal handling check, and Fyra and then Abria just tell the party they continue down the road until they reach By Rodin. Once again, we never get a Mighty Nine, what would you like to do next moment. The party's just told what they do next. Now, this is not a personal attack on Abria, mind you, but I think Abria Eingar is bad for Critical Role. What I originally ticked off is just not jiving with her style during the first few episodes, expanded into the realization of this poor storytelling and world building, poor running of a tabletop RPG, especially Critical Role. She has all the power to craft the fantastic narrative that she wants to tell, since it's not an open world game. But still, she's all over the place. I think the choice to make this an eight-episode mini-campaign, this epic multi-city god-involving tale was the wrong choice. In my opinion, this should have been a more grounded story set in a single city. Iman in the surrounding area, for example. The Pasca Thieves Guild hook was good enough. Hell, even this alternate Fey world was a great one, but we move on from each plot hook every episode or two, and it's honestly pretty hard to keep up with. 
I mean, why is this happening to a bunch of level 2 to 3 characters anyway? To make them feel powerful, they're allowed huge discounts with Gilmore, who decides to give a bunch of strangers he literally just met a bunch of special items and an insane discount. Later on, characters are given insane abilities such as Dariax's ability to fly or Fern's ability to adjust others' fates by re-rolling d20 rolls within 20 feet of herself. It just doesn't feel earned. It feels like a gimme to make the story more epic and exciting. I don't know if this was talked about beforehand. Maybe Abria was told to make this campaign exciting and perfect for newcomers to sell people who are used to Matt's expansive world building and NPC portrayal. If that's true, that would be completely unfair to Abria. If it was Abria's decision, it was a terrible one because Exandria Unlimited turned out poorly. Now, I didn't say Abria is a bad GM. I said she was bad for Critical Role. I went and checked out the first episode of Dimension 20's Misfits and Magic, where Abria GMs a game utilizing the Kids on Brooms system, which is a spin-off of the Kids on Bike systems, which I actually backed on Kickstarter. Essentially, Kids on Brooms is a play on Harry Potter. Kids in the modern world are accepted into a school of magic and hijinks ensues. I loved the first episode, The Chosen Ones. So much that I subscribed to Dropout so I can listen to the rest of this four-episode campaign. Abria, while not perfect, I find her portrayal of NPCs in both this and EXU to be a bit lackluster, in that they all sound sort of the same, passive-aggressive, and many do this stutter-talk type dialogue where they don't finish complete sentences. Welcome to the Flame Reach Outpost. What can I... You all seem a little pressed. Why don't you come in? I can bring you some water. In setting intention is important. I don't feel great about the... Well, now I think maybe it's... Re <gasps> but Abria does a good job in this episode and even does some voices here and there, which she did with Pasca. I honestly laughed many times throughout this two and a half hour episode. One of the big differences from EXU that I noticed was Abria and the cast have so much fun, which is a good segue into the next section, the cast. I can't and won't blame all the issues with Exandria Unlimited on Abria Iyengar. The cast has as much to do with why it failed as the plot and the GMing. But let's start with some of the good because there were a few, albeit minor positives. Matt as Dariax. Dariax is pure chaos and stupidity, and I love it. Dariax's devil may care attitude towards everything and everyone was awesome. Seeing Matt play while essentially giving zero fucks was a pleasure to watch. He had a lot of fun and it shows, but my god, why was he cursed with such awful dice rolls? I guess that does actually fit Dariax's character pretty well. The only issue I really had with Dariax, and it's more of an issue with the rest of the players, is that they're basically all agents of chaos, minus Aurum. Dariax is the perfect comic relief in a group that takes things a bit more seriously. I'm thinking of the Mighty Nine and Jester in this situation. Dorian. I love Robbie Damon. This was his first time playing D&D, and honestly hope it isn't the last time I'm able to watch him play a tabletop RPG. Robbie was great at thinking on his feet and great at role-playing Dorian. Dorian Storm as a character was fine. It took him a long time to warm up and reveal more about his backstory, which I found was an issue shared between all of the Crown Keepers. We don't have 100 plus episodes, we have 8, so keeping a character mysterious, not sharing their backstory, their real name, etc. doesn't help us latch on and care about them. There's just not enough time to do that. I'm glad Dorian Storm made it through the finale, because if there is a season 2 with the same cast, I'd love to see where Robbie takes Dorian after experiencing season 1. Hell, I'd love Robbie in Campaign 3 for that matter. Opal. I must admit, I hated Opal in the first few episodes. Essentially a valley girl with a fish out of water story kind of took me out of the show a bit. Granted, this gem just so happens to have her sister slash patron living inside her own head. Now, Amy being new, seemed to talk over PCs a little bit and disregard exactly what was going on in the beginning, not being the best team player. I don't hold this against her as she was still learning the group dynamic of D&D, but it wasn't always the most fun thing to watch. The charm person sequence from episode two, the Oh No Plateau, comes to mind. Opal charms one of the nameless thieves and just walks away from her friends with the foe in an attempt to keep him out of the battle by going for a drink. Just take Arthur yeah. away to the nearest tavern, which is where? <laughs> you don't know because you've never been on this street. Wait, so we're just going to be right around the corner. Yeah. I think this was just a situation of her still grasping the concepts of how D&D works. I mentioned in my review of episode two that Opal is definitely the wild card, but she's a little too wild. I have to give Amy Carrero credit though. She really turned Opal around. And while maybe not my favorite character of the bunch, I didn't mind her by the end, especially since Opal basically became the main character of Alexandria Unlimited's first season. Which I didn't quite understand Abria's plan with this, since Amy's a first time player, still figuring everything out. That was a lot of pressure to put on Amy to perform. Speaking of Abrea and Amy, I have to dive into this a bit. 
What was going on between the two of them? There was a lot of hostility from Abria towards Amy, and I find it difficult to simply shrug it off as two friends giving each other shit. What? She feels I'm nothing. sorry, did I fucking stutter? <laughs> <laughs> you were in his hands, and you didn't ask for the circlet. You made your choice. Okay. So what do I do now? Nothing. You're done, unless you use your movement. Which Abria references in a D&D Beyond interview. Uh, like me being extra mean to Amy. That's just because we came out of the gate and I was like, bestie. So I'm going to give her a, like a harder time. Like, because even being a brand new player, you just have that sense of like, okay, I see what we're doing here. You're going to like push me as the teacher in the classroom and I'm going to give you a hard time because you're new. And like, that's going to be our energy. We knew that they are co-workers for this project, but you don't always like everyone you work with. Many times, Abria was quite snippy and mean towards Amy, who would be asking a question or attempting to do something she shouldn't, and it was uncomfortable to watch. They shrug it off on social media, but that's because they're being professional since this was a job for them and they both want to keep working. But who really knows? Don't forget to love each other, right? Taking Ted's power away from Amy was also quite the bummer. I know a lot of people might be thinking, well, all Opal had to do to get her powers back was to apologize to Ted, but... Amy roleplayed Opal perfectly, a stubborn teenager who doesn't feel the need to apologize. Orem, the stoic halfling Orem, who attempted to play the voice of reason for a while, was my least favorite character. I really don't know what Liam was going for with Orem. I understand his roleplaying from the beginning. Orem is not a bad person, he doesn't want to become a criminal, but continues to fall around this group of chaotic hooligans. For what reason? Why doesn't he just leave them? For the purposes of a D&D &D game, that wouldn't make sense to have Orm just leave the group, but he was left with no choice but to conform to the group's decisions. Orm dropped a lot of time into the first Critical Role campaign, which was a confusing concept for me. I've yet to watch Campaign 1, other than a couple episodes years ago, so I was lost for the majority of the references. I don't understand why Liam and Abria, with Gilmore, decided to heavily reference a campaign that was not the one that, I'd assume most people just came from since it literally ended a few weeks prior to Exandria Limited Campaign 2. Maybe it was to hype the Taldori Reborn campaign book? I'm not 100% sure, and now I'm starting to go off on a bit of a tangent here. I just thought that Orem, with his whisper speaking and lack of any real type of personality, just sort of felt like a background character and it didn't do anything to grab me or to like his character. Fern. Ah, Fern Calloway, played by Ashley Johnson. I am indifferent with Fern. I was extremely interested in the Dark Mirror Fern story that could have been so much more. Otherwise, Fern didn't really give me too much to think about other than a little comic relief here and there. I think maybe it's just a bit of how Ashley roleplays? I have similar feelings of indifference towards Yasha of Campaign 2. Granted, Ashley is absent for most of what I've listened to so far, but when she's there, she's portraying the strong, silent type. I find this actually to be a theme with both Campaign 2 veterans, Ashley and Liam. They seem to enjoy playing characters that sort of take a backseat to others. I mean, while Caleb is one of my favorite characters in Campaign 2, it did take him quite a long time to open up. Neither Caleb or Yasha, or Orem or Fern, are characters that take charge as the leader of their respective groups. Which contributes more to Xandria Unlimited's unfortunate downfall. No one took charge to be the leader. Imagine if Travis or Sam replaced Fern or Orem with a character of their own. I would think we have to have a party that moved towards some sort of goal without the need for our last character to join the mix. On the other hand, maybe this was by design. Take a backseat to let the other players shine, i.e. Matt and the newbies, Amy and Robbie. Fyra Rai. Fyra Rai, our guest PC played by Angelai Bimani. I loved Fyra in her induction during episode 4. Angelai's performance was excellent and brought a lot of needed energy to the table. Unfortunately for me, this did not last and I wound up disliking Fyra. Mostly because it's pretty easy to see that Fire was brought in to help round this cast, stop them from becoming a group of murder hobos, and set them on a main goal and main path. I just hated how Fire was used. She has a gift that feeds her information. I mean, this is clearly Angelai working with Abria about dragging them to the next location and for the purpose of the plot. There's no other way around that, as Fire knows things that the rest of the party does not. Hell, she even remembers what happened to the party during their week that they all forgot, but never tells them or us. Well, Doreen remembers after dreaming of the Spider Queen. I just found all this to be off-putting. When she's done with her job of bringing the party to Nirdal Pak, she conveniently is told her dead sister is alive and she needs to help her, so she must leave. The Crown Keepers were also quite the weird bunch. There was no real reason why they were all sticking together other than the fact that they all lost their memories. No one really seems to care. No one really has any sort of goals or motivations. Many times Matt, slash Dariax, attempts to convince the party that sometimes it's just fun to do bad things. 
Okay, but that can only be so interesting, especially when the group doesn't even really do that. I mean, they have the crown, this vestige of divergence, and no one puts it on until the final episode. Why don't they just get rid of it? They haul it around all campaign for what? Giving Exandria Unlimited a score out of 5, let's first look at my scores for each episode. I rate it on a 5 star scale, 1 is awful, 2 is bad, 3 is good with flaws, 4 is great, and 5 is amazing. Episode 1, 2 out of 5. Episode 2, 1 out of 5. Episode 3, 3 out of 5. Episode 4, 3 out of 5. Episode 5, 1 out of 5. Episode 6, 1 out of 5. Episode 7, 2 out of 5. And Episode 8, the finale, 2 out of 5. Exandria Unlimited as a whole gets a 2 out of 5. It's bad. While there were a few chuckles and entertaining sequences here and there, I cannot recommend Critical Role's first foray into a campaign without Mercer as DM. A jumbled mess of 12 plus, mostly unresolved story hooks does not make for good entertainment or storytelling. Critical Role failed in their attempt to create a series that doesn't require a huge commitment to tell an epic adventure. I think Campaign 2 is the logical choice if you haven't listened to it yet. What starts out as a decent enough adventure gets to be quite the enjoyable epic story, fantastic characters and role playing and lots of laughs and twists at least from my experience through about half of it. And remember, even if you decide to wait until Campaign 3, you'll still have a lot of downtime in between episodes that you can use to catch up on Campaign 2. I know whenever I finish Campaign 2, I'll still have plenty of time to finally jump into Campaign 1 while I wait for episodes of Campaign 3 to come out every Thursday. If you're looking for a better introduction to TTRPGs than Exandria Unlimited, and don't want to commit to 100 plus episodes of either full Critical Role campaigns, let's take some time to talk about a few recommendations for me. Call of Cthulhu, Shadows of the Crystal Palace. This is a one-shot run by campaign PC regular Talos and Jaffe, who runs the game as the Keeper of Arcane Lore. Call of Cthulhu takes place in the Cthulhu Mythos, i.e. the Eldritch world of cosmic horror created by H.P. Lovecraft. I'm not a particular fan of horror, but this one-shot really sells everything. Call of Cthulhu, horror, and tabletop RPGs. The cosplay, the set, the story, and production of the episode are all truly fantastic. I really wish Talisin ran more Call of Cthulhu for Critical Role. This one shot basically started me on my tabletop RPG and Critical Role journey, not only because I started Campaign 2 shortly after this, but because I also wound up buying the Call of Cthulhu starter set, the Keeper rulebook, Cthulhu Confidential, a two player rule setting, the Dungeons and Dragons Essentials kit, and later Rhyme of the Frost Maiden and Curse of Strahd. And because of COVID, I still haven't been able to play, just been able to read and enjoy these books for what they are. Call of Cthulhu Shadows of the Crystal Palace is highly recommended, as it also includes a fantastic role-playing PC cast that includes main cast regulars, Marisha Ray, Travis Willingham, and Liam O'Brien. It's also long enough to build a world and not overstay its welcome at four hours long. Plus, Call of Cthulhu is meant to be played in one-shots or mini-campaigns, so you're really getting the full experience here. Celebrity D&D with Terry Crews. One of the first one-shots I checked out after finding out about Critical Role. Matt Mercer runs a game in the world of Warcraft, world of Azeroth, with more campaign regulars, Marisha and Talison, with special guests Terry Crews, obviously, and Jessica Chobot, and voice actors Troy Baker and Ashley Birch. It's a fun time all around and an easy listen at two and a half hours long. Misfits and Magic, The Chosen Ones. As mentioned earlier, this is a game run by Abria that I can recommend as it's a lot of fun. A modern take on Harry Potter with a comedic twist. It's only four episodes long, but episodes two through four are locked behind the Dimension 20 paywall, although a one month subscription is only $4.99 and currently your first month is 25% off. I took the plunge after watching the first episode because it was a lot of fun. Definitely check that out. Exandria Limited was a rare misstep for Critical Role. Tremendous amounts of hype led to a lackluster final product. At the very least, it'll provide Critical Role with some very important feedback about how to handle future seasons of Exandria Limited, which I'm a bit curious to see how they handle. I won't lie, I'll probably check it out, even when 25 hours of season one was quite a hard pill to swallow. I think they also learned the hard truth that Critical Role might cease to be the giant that they are without Matthew Mercer sitting in the DM chair. I'm curious to see what you all think about Exandria Unlimited, critters and newbies alike. If you made it to the end of this video, please like this video and leave a comment to let me know what you think about this review, my points, if I'm wrong, if you agree. Reviewing and creating content about my favorite hobbies is why I started Current Kick, both my blog and this YouTube channel. So if you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing and supporting me on Patreon. I cover and plan to cover via reviews, vlogs, video essays, and more. Everything from board and tabletop games, miniature collecting and painting, war games, to movies, anime, TV series, action figures, gunpla models, and video games, just to name a few. Anyways, 
Thanks for stopping by. See you all again soon. Later.